Joining me right now, I cannot wait to get her take on this, my good friend, the amazing, the beautiful Carol Roth, recovering investment banker, as she describes herself. And she's author of a fabulous book, The War on Small Business, which is a must read, available at HarperCollins. I always say buy from like HarperCollins or Barnes & Noble because they weight those higher on bestseller lists. Uh, great book. You got to read it. I got to, Carol, first off, I know how you feel about <laughs> what Saki said, but just, you know, for maybe the people watching us, you know, those tax giveaways that all the wealthy people are getting. Talk to us about this because I enjoyed my Trump tax cut. I'd like to keep it. I don't want what Biden's offering. Yeah, the interesting thing about taxing is you tax something when you want less of it. You repeal taxes when you want more of it. So when you want more prosperity, you repeal taxes. And that's what happened with the Tax Cut and, uh, cut and Jobs Act. Say that 10 times fast. Mm. Um, what people, you know, kind of in the media, the talking points have gotten away from was the fact that, quote unquote, revenue, and I hate using that word, but that's what the government calls it, the tax collections actually increased the year after they cut taxes. So it wasn't that we have a tax collection issue. It was the fact that they ended up spending even more, which increased the deficit. So this idea that letting people keep the money that they earn and put it to work more productively as stewards of their own capital versus giving it over to the government and expecting that you know dysfunctional clown show to be able to be an efficient steward of capital is really what we're talking about here. And we've seen the numbers, it's proven out, um, but unfortunately the talking points never really align with that. And by the way, Dana, as I was listening to that piece, the idea that we're not going to tax anybody who doesn't make $400,000 a year. Oh, by the way, I don't know what inflation is. I think inflation is a big tax. And oh, yeah. by the way, why are why are you hiring eighty seven thousand IRS agents? It's not for the couple hundred billionaires. It's because they're coming after you. That's a great point. We're talking to Carol Roth, uh, and this story. I saw the story of Wall Street Journal where they were saying that even if you did, it made like six hundred dollars, like on a side gig online, then you better you better pay your do your ten ninety nine on that, or the IRS is going to come after you. Which again, I was told. Carol, we were all told from the administration that they were only going after the super rich people. If you're making 600 bucks on a side gig online, that doesn't sound like, you know, that doesn't sound like uh, Bill Gates money. No, in fact, I have an op-ed on this that has been held by a major outlet for a long time, and I'm going to have to go say, put it out there. Uh, but this came out of the American Rescue Plan. This was Biden last March put this into effect. It used to be if you sold on Etsy or eBay or you did a PayPal transaction, whatever it was, that the threshold was $20,000 or I think it was mm -hmm. 200 transactions, something that would actually simulate a business um, to ensure that you got this 1099K that was reported to the IRS to make sure you were reporting right. and paying your taxes because you have to. Now that threshold with the American Rescue Plan, as you said, has been lowered to $600. So even if you don't owe money, let's say it's something that you've you know, traded and sold at a loss and your accountant says you don't actually owe any money on it, it still triggers that reporting, which means you may get audited and you have to keep all of your paperwork in order to defend that extra $600, which is just disgusting. This is not about going after the wealthy. This is firmly about going after you and distracting you with all of this wealthy talk. Because we know we just lived through the biggest transfer of wealth from Main Street to Wall Street. The, the people who are wealthy and well-connected are not the ones that ever pay when they say they're going after them. And this is a great transition talking to our friend Carol Roth about the people getting involved in this Twitter fight. And I've been telling people <laughs> who listen, we're in hundreds of different markets and there's millions of people who listen every day. And then if we have the simulcast here where everyone can see the lovely Carol Roth that even if you don't have a Twitter account, even if you're not active on Twitter, this still affects you because we're in a weird space. It's the public square and I'm a free speech purist and I'm pretty hands off when it comes to government. But at the same time, I also don't like governments acting like agents of the state, and I don't like them acting as like puppets for uh, oligarchs and people like, uh, you know, BlackRock and, you know, Vanguard and all this other stuff. Right. I was looking at the biggest shareholders of Twitter, and I actually didn't know this until all this happened last week. You, I, you really have like two people, and the rest are financial institutions. That shocked me. 
I was, and I feel embarrassed about it. I was, I had no idea that that's who owned Twitter. So this fight that Elon Musk is having with the board has broken a lot of stuff out in the open. Uh, he made this move, and Twitter, I guess, is getting their buyers group together. Talk to us a little bit about this because this is this is going to have this is, I think, is going to redefine some stuff. Yeah, it's it's uh, as somebody who is um, you know very well tied to the markets has been following them you know, basically my entire life. I'm really glad that more people are getting interested in these things because it's important. This is economic freedom, and you should understand. And the reality is, the top three asset managers, BlackRock, who has 10 trillion in assets under management, Vanguard. Trillion around 8 trillion in State Street, they end up being the top shareholder in pretty much every public company, at least one of those, sometimes multiple of those, just because of the number of ass the amount of assets that they have under management. And I don't think people really understood this. So when you say, oh, we don't want Elon Musk, you know, a billionaire controlling this, my retort was like, wait till you find out about now their number one shareholder Vanguard, you know, and they're eight trillion dollars in assets under management. Um, so you know this is an interesting issue with Elon Musk because there are people who are really focused on the product and the free speech side, mm. but there's a whole separate side, which is the market, the board responsibility, the fiduciary duty to shareholders and the business model side of Twitter. And those have kind of split apart. And it kind of seems like this is more about a battle um, you know, for free speech, for protecting some semblance of digital rights, which have been just completely obliterated. And you know, that's what people are focused on. On and kind of gotten away from the fact that this is a stock that hasn't gone anywhere um, pretty much since it was it went public in 2013. At the same time, when the S and P 500 has you know gone up more than three times, Facebook has gone up 4.6 times. I mean, they have not been able to That's really figure point. out a. Yeah, they haven't been able to figure out the, the business model. So the valuation, the reason why the valuation is so low is because they haven't been able to figure out the business model. It's not about free speech. And all these issues are kind of getting conflated right now. The 43 billion, I think, wasn't that the wasn't that the, the what it was valued at? And I think what is, some of the one Saudi prince or whatever was trying to lecture <laughs> Elon Musk about that. I kept thinking 40. There's no way Twitter's worth that much. That seems way too high. That seems way too high. So that's with his premium. So based, based on before he took his stake, because his stake gave it a bump, and if right. he wasn't involved, it would fall back down. It's about a 38% premium to where the stock was trading before that. So that is a nice, um, you know, kind of gift to shareholders, something that you would really want to consider seriously, even this, though the stock has been higher when everything was higher, you know, kind of 14 months ago, um, given the period we've gone in and based on the financial metrics, metrics, again, they do about $5 billion in revenue and they don't make a profit. Their operating margin is tiny compared again to a Facebook that has like yeah. a, I think it's like a 40% operating margin. So, you know, they haven't been able to suss out the business model to create the value. Yeah, what he's offering is really um, a price that if you are a, a board member has a fiduciary duty to shareholders, looking at the prospects for the company and what they have and haven't been able to do and that price, you would have to seriously consider that. Yeah, you, ab yeah, you would. Uh, talking with Carol Roth here. And that's what they're being accused of not doing. Because I heard Ron DeSantis just a little bit ago. We had some audio, <laughs> came across some audio where he's saying they're going to look at, you know, what their 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 obligation to their shareholders is is it's almost to me and I, I i know enough to be dangerous when talking about this stuff <laughs> everybody does <laughs> i mean I, it almost looks like they're wanting to self-destruct rather than honor their obligation to their shareholders i that's kind of how i'm looking at that. is that what we're seeing play out as a as their way to kind of thwart musk yeah, so it's it's hard, you know, without having the sort of inside intel. Um, but you know, I in my recovering investment banker days, one thing that I would do is write something called a fairness opinion, and that is if you have a buyer um, of a particular company, both on the side of the company and the side of the buyer, you might have to write an opinion to say, is this a fair value for the company? And this would be a very easy fairness opinion to write. Sometimes you have to really kind of stretch to go, yeah, yeah. is this fair? So this would does seem fair. Now they may come back and say, well, maybe he doesn't have the funding secured or you know some some other 
reason. But just from the outside looking in, it really does seem like it's about power and control and not about the fiduciary duty. And last, again, we may not know, but there's been some um, you know, kind of rumors out in the market that there are maybe some now some other folks who are interested, maybe a white knight that will come in. But again, based on the financial metrics, they're talking about these financial firms. There's no way that the financial metrics would support a financial type buyer buying this out. You have to either have a really, really solid plan or have some other reason why you want to own Twitter to be able to buy it out at this kind of evaluation. There's a lot that is coming out of this that has been drawn out into the into the public eye and the battle over the privately owned and administered public square and <laughs> the machinations of all these players. I mean, this has been if 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 Musk doesn't succeed at anything else, this was a big victory, I think, to open everybody's eyes to that. Of course, I think we'd all like to see, you know, Twitter just, you know, people just let people speak and meet free speech with more free speech. But I, I have. Well, I'll do you one up on that. I would like to see them and all of the other big tech companies sign on to a digital bill of rights. I mean, the reality of the idea. situation is that it used to be we were an agrarian society and it was about owning land and you would have those rights protected by the government. Now we're in this sort of technocracy and we have these accounts and these phones and we don't actually really own anything. And so I think there needs to be more focus on property rights and individual rights and digital rights. And we don't need the government to do it. We just need a consortium of these tech companies to come in and to be fair and to apply those rules and those principles fairly technocracy i think that's the title of your next book carol it should be <laughs> just saying just saying i mean i'm not saying i'd buy a, a ton of copies but i probably buy a ton of copies that's a that's a that's, it, it's play it's playing around in here already data <laughs> i'm telling you let me know because i i want a galley i want to read it carol roth always so good to have you on my friend thank you so much for your expert opinion on this and breaking it all down for us good to see you my pleasure take care